12.30, come to Christian Fellowship for our indoor picnic. <laughs> It'd be a lot funner eating chicken not standing in the rain, I'll tell you that. It seems like the world today is getting a little bit more difficult if you haven't noticed it. Things that we thought would never happen are happening. Things that we thought churches would never do or advocate they're doing. And so we come to realize that there's this whole shift, this whole snowball going down the hill pretty fast thing that we have to be aware of. And so a lot of us can say, well, we're aware of that. We realize that's happening. But then what do we do about it? We've got to do something about it. And so today it's titled Bucking the Trend. And I shared a story. I guess I'll share this uh, and I've shared it here before about a, a young girl that uh, wanted to go to a movie. Now, before I get to that point, how many of you have ever, in your arguments with mom or dad, when you wanted to do something, you were laying it on as thick as you could, you were trying to build your case, and they were sometimes listening and sometimes close to giving in, and then you would finally say, everybody's doing it. And that was kind of the pitfall, because as soon as mom heard that or dad heard that, they would say, oh, really? Everybody's doing it? So if everybody jumps off a cliff, is that what you're going to do? Remember that thing? It just kind of like deflates you and they would have victory over you and you wouldn't go. So this girl had the same thing. She wanted to go to an R-rated movie. Uh, Mom's like, why is it rated R? She said, there's just a little nudity. There's just a little swearing. Otherwise, Mom, it's just a great movie. Can I go? Can I go? And then she said, everybody's going. Well, Mom said, you know what? I love you and stuff and I you know, don't want to hurt you, but no, you can't go to the movie. So up she slams the door in her room and stays there and pouts. So mom had this idea. She decided to bake some brownies for her daughter. And you know, that smell, everybody loves brownies. And so she decided to go out to the backyard where the dog does his business and bring in a spoonful of the dog's business and put in the brownies. So now she bakes these brownies. They're smelling fantastic. The daughter comes down. She's feeling better, of course, and says, can I have some brownies? And mom said, have all you want. It's just one thing, though. There's just a little dog poop in it. Just a little. Just a little dog poop in it. Go ahead. Have all you want. And she wouldn't eat because there was something dirty in there. She did not want that, and so she stepped back and said, no, thank you. And so the point she was trying to make is, daughter, you say that everyone's going to this movie, even though it's got just a little bit of dirt in it, it's no big deal, but now I offer you something with a little bit of dirt, and you say, no, thank you. Isn't that kind of how we are in human nature? If you really want to do something, even if it crosses a line, per se, you go ahead and try to do it and justify it and stuff. And so today it's titled Bucking the Trend because we need to be able to not only identify wrong trends, not only identify things that are bad, but then we need to do something about it. Uh, just because you know it's bad doesn't mean it's right then to do. In fact, since you know it's bad, you know exactly what you should or shouldn't do. We've talked about trends before, things that, uh, that impact us and how. The, trend, the, the definition of a trend is a general direction taken, kind of like everyone's trending to go this way, a prevailing tendency and a current style or preference. Now, when we were growing up, everyone had the phone on the wall, the big square phone or something. Well, then the trend was to get not just a three-foot cord, but a 20-foot cord, right? Because then you could get away from the phone, you could go sit down or whatever it was, now the trend is to get smartphones. The trend is to get, uh, you know, a pocket phone. How many of you still have your home lines? There's a few of us that do, but do you sometimes wonder why you do? Spending the kind of money that we do sometimes. So the trend is that we're kind of getting away from that. Um, a lot of businesses fail once the trend changes and they no longer kind of fit in. Now, we talked years ago, I talked about going to the state fair and Brad went to the state fair and whatnot, but there was a year when the invisible dog walker thing was huge. You guys remember it was a yellow nylon rope that somebody had slipped wire into and then it had the little harness for a dog and he would hold onto the handle and it would be out in front of him like he's walking this invisible dog. It seemed like everywhere you went someone had that gimmick. It was a trend that was taking place. Streaking was a trend that was taking place. Anyone honestly say you went streaking? All right. Liars. Somebody did. <laughs> Pet rocks. Anyone ever own a pet rock? Here's what's so funny. We went and bought the pet rock. We walk over rocks in the driveway to go buy a rock, a pet rock. Turd birds. I've talked about that. I was so proud of a turd bird I had made out of a horse apple shellacked and with little eyes in it and stuff. And I paid money for that. I was proud of it. Billy bass. Anyone have a billy bass? 
<laughs> yes, and we still have nightmares about Billy Bass. Cabbage Patch Dolls. And you don't hear about them at all anymore, but there was a time when they darn near murdered each other to get a Cabbage Patch Doll. It was the trend of a Christmas. Everyone had to have one to give to somebody. And so Cabbage Patch Dolls, it was a huge trend. Now, some of you are older, so you might remember the poodle skirts or the penny loafers or the guys rolled their cigarettes up in the sleeve kind of thing. Even cigarettes now are, the trend is that people are not uh, smoking too much. Hippies, they had the, the tie-dye shirts and the peace signs and all that. Uh, around the late 60s, early 70s, you had the anti-Vietnam protests. That became a trend that grew and grew in the country. Uh, how many of you were discoers? <laughs> Broken Wheel used to have a disco lit up floor, just like you saw on Saturday night on Fever. There was a guy out there that always dressed that way. He, he was very good at dancing, too, but... Thankfully, disco died, right? The trend's no longer there. Fashions, miniskirts were out there. And I've asked this before, and some of you admitted it, leisure suits. Any guys with a leisure suit still sitting in your closet? Remove those. Burn those. Do something to those. I don't think they're ever going to be back. I don't think they're going to be I, don't, I hope not. Hairstyles, they change all the time. Um, older ladies, a lot of times, uh, uh, younger lady has blue jeans and whatnot. As you get older, uh, polyester elastic band pants, it seems to come into play. Um, again, remember the definition of a trend, a general direction taken, a prevailing tendency, or a current style or a preference. Even in politics today, there's kind of a trend taking place. And, and then I've got to beat everyone up on this one, because this one's probably the one that I don't like the most. It's food is getting healthier. I mean, even downstairs, when we started 13 years ago, it was all fattening stuff, and people just loved it. Amen. Now they're looking for the fruits and the, you know, all this section here. Where's the veggies and those sort of things? I'm telling you, the trend of people eating is changing healthier. How many of you are trying to eat healthier? Boring. No. <laughs> the point I'm, I how many of you still want to be eating potatoes, lots of butter, and warm bread? Okay, keep your hand up because. We won't be around longer. If you guys, if you, healthy people are going to outlive us. Our, we're a dying breed. That's definitely true. So again, we, we're going to say we're going to buck the trend. You've heard that saying. Buck the trend, meaning going against the grain. Going against what society is saying. Or if everyone is doing it, we're not going to be one of those everyones. Um, growing up, uh, one of my birthdays, I asked for a banana bike. Remember the banana bikes? Yep. And the banana seat and the little uh, sissy bar on the back and the kind of chopper things. Yeah, everyone had those. Prior to that, we had a black bike that Brad learned to ride on. I learned to ride on. The neighbors learned to ride on. It was just a normal black bike, kind of like that Wizard of Oz gal rode, that kind of normal bike. But then banana bikes came into play. Well, now banana bikes are nothing compared to the bikes they got anymore. And so we decided that we would cut off um, forks off of other ones, bikes, and stick them on our fork. And so now we had choppers. So then we're getting really cool. We're bucking the trend in a way. We're changing things, doing things different. Nowadays, that bike would not be cool whatsoever because the trend has gone from us jumping three inches off the ground thinking we were evil Knievel to now they're doing flips backwards every which way. It's, it's just crazy what people can do on anything these days. We didn't even think of doing that. The trend was not to do those sort of things. We were kind of just boring, I guess you could say. So to go against the grain, when everyone's buying or wearing a certain type of clothing, uh, someone else will wear something different. They just don't. They don't. They don't fall into the system. They go against the system. Now I got to say, some trends are interesting. Some gals wear shoes that look so painful, so painful to wear, but by golly, they're cool. It's the current trend, right? And so their toes are like this, all crunched up in their <laughs> shoes, and they're saying, you know, they want to get them off as soon as possible, but yet they look very nice in those while they're out walking in them. Meanwhile, your toes stay that way someday, and then you're not quite so attractive, I'll just say. And so we realize that we want to buck the trend. Now, biblical Christians buck the trend. There are cultural Christians, meaning those that attend church, but don't really see a difference in their life uh, coming to church or whatnot. might be the only thing you see, but outside these walls, they're living life just like anybody else that doesn't attend church and doesn't even believe in God. That's a cultural Christian. It's a tradition. It's something that we do. I've done it for every. I've done it all my life. I've been to church every Sunday, but yet your life outside these walls, if you would confess, looked no different than someone that's never walked into the building. That's a cultural Christian, and that's the trend these days. Now, a biblical Christian is someone that takes it very seriously, attends church, but then takes this Bible and actually opens it between the week, 
You know, it doesn't have dust everywhere. You spend some time in prayer. You might go to a Bible study. You might even, you have some people go to three services on a Sunday. In other words, it's something important in their life. They're bucking the trend of the churches of these days. Because more and more churches are identifying that less and less people are attending less and less often. And so that's becoming the trend in a church. So I just want to say that while we talk about negative trends outside the church, we've also got to admit that inside the church there's also some trends taking place. Now, the Huffington Post did a study, and they said recently they did an article on youth and trends in morality. In other words, looking at the young people and the morals of these people, these young people. Now, the Huffington Post, in their study, admits that morality, or the morals in America's youth today, are on a slippery decline. Sorry, youth that are sitting here today, but that's what they're saying. So they're identifying five sources for students' morals today. In other words, what makes them tick? What makes them feel like they have good morals or bad morals? The five are this. The first one is morals are determined by results or consequences. In other words, if it feels good, you do it. Hey, that felt pretty good, so I'm going to keep doing that. My morals are that I will accept those things, uh, even, even if it's you know wrong. Consequences, I'll, I'll weigh that out. I once worked with a guy, that uh, a young man, that was he was brilliant. I said, you're either going to be a brilliant scientist or one of the greatest criminals ever in the history of mankind. He eventually got shot. He eventually ended up in prison. And I don't know if he's still there. He was out the last I ever saw him. But the point is, is that he would make a decision, and he asked, actually admitted this, Brian, I know what's wrong, but I decide if I can pay the consequence or not. In other words, if I'm willing to do the time, or if I'm willing to, if I get caught, pay that fine, or whatever it might be, I'm willing to do that. I, I base everything based on the consequence of the action. Not that it's right or wrong, it's that I want to do it or not, and am I willing, is it, do I want to do it enough to pay the price if I do get caught? Most, most criminals are upset once they get caught, that's what they feel bad about. The cockpit, not necessarily what they were doing. Morals are determined by pleasure or happiness. In other words, again, if it feels good, I will do it. If it, if it makes me happy, I will do it. That's how I base my morals. I, I think they're good morals as long as I feel good about doing it. Morals are determined by reputation or appearance. That kind of fits into the peer pressure kind of thing in a way. I, I'll decide by reputation or appearance if it's important. Morals are determined by context or the environment. Morals are determined by affect or influence. Did you notice anything missing in those ideals of what are creating the morals in our youth today? No parent input, no right or wrong input, no Christ input. Nowhere in those five did they say, my morals are based on if it's right or if it's wrong. Or my morals are based on what my parents taught me, how I should act or what I should do. It's based on external experiences of that child. Whatever this world is feeding me, I will decide if I agree with it or not, not necessarily if it's right or wrong, but if I agree with it or not. And that's why we're seeing so many different things change in the world today, because the majority of society might say that action there or that decision there, while the Bible might say it's wrong, while even the law says it's wrong, we value it and we say it's okay. I mean, even illegal immigration, which is supposed to be you come across the country, you want to be in the United States, you take classes, you... You uh, take tests, you do an oath, and you pay taxes. But there are a lot of people that are choose not to do that. They're called, we call them illegal immigrants. In other words, they're here illegally because they didn't follow the process. But society today is saying, oh, don't be saying they're illegal. They're undocumented immigrants. That sounds so much better. Just It rolls off the tongue so much better. They're undocumented. But it's illegal. But society today is pushing on us that, you know what, that's just fine. Our morals say no problem that they came in illegally. And that's the struggle that we're facing. Abortion is the same issue. The trend was abortion was just fine. It's a women's choice. And so we're up to 60 million babies that have been murdered. But did you notice the trend in the last year in this country? There's starting to be some reversal to the laws, some tightening of the laws about heartbeat laws and whatnot. So they're starting to say, that, you know what? It seems like every woman has always given birth to a human being. There's no cows, there's no horses, there's no chickens. They're always human. And so maybe we need to start looking at the unborn and getting them rights too. Now I bring up the women's rights thing, and that's great. I guess we all have the right to do anything. Men have rights too. But I've got to point out this. If we're going to buck the trend, we say that I surrender my rights, and I go with what Jesus Christ says. If I'm going to be, he's going to be Lord of my life, and, and I'm going to be his servant, 
then I am surrendering some of me to say, I want what you want for me in my life. And if we'll start to live that way, we'll see a big change in us. Uh, one of the songs that was sang this morning up on the hill, it speaks about when you come to the end of yourself. That's the greatest thing that can happen is when we come to the end of ourself. Because then we, we hand ourselves over to Christ. We surrender. And that's what we need to do. If we'll surrender, our morals will change in our lives, I guarantee you. Deuteronomy 12, 30, Moses was talking to the people about false gods. He said, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them. He's saying it's going to be very easy to fall into false prophets and false teachers. You need to know what the truth is so that you don't go with the trend. You don't go with the flow. And how many of you know that in some of the churches and some of the Bibles these days, they're changing things that say what is used to be wrong to God is now right on the basis of love. But you know what? If you love someone enough, you'll teach them what's right and wrong. And then you pray that they will accept that and say, you know what? I would like to do that, but it's wrong. So I will not do that. So moral and societal trends, they're getting to be very difficult. Now, they did one on premarital sex. And they did a study on that, and they said that there's an increase in those having premarital sex prior to marriage. They said 70% of the females talked to said yes, by the age of 19 they had had sex. 65% of the men said by the age of 19 that they've had sex. But then they had the reason. This is the reason you're seeing an increase in premarital sex. They said because the age of getting married is increasing, it's around 23 or even up to 25 years old is the average these days. They said, come on, there's, there's puberty and all these years before we get married. How can you expect us not to have sex prior to getting married? Because it's now seven years out or it's six years out or whatever it might be. So they're justifying to say that it's an increasing, which is true, but they're saying the reason is, is because we're not getting married sooner. So, that, so we're going to fall into that. So that's what we struggle with because society is starting to say, you know what, that's just part of life. I read uh, Nathaniel and Hans Bluedorn wrote a book called The Fallacy Detective. They said this, the issue is not whether everybody else is doing it. The issue is whether it is right or it is wrong. I'm going to read that again. The issue is not whether everybody else is doing it. The issue is whether it is right or it is wrong. And therein lies the struggle for all of us. Because we have to all decide what is right and what is wrong. And if we say, you know what, Brian, I, I just don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong. Then I encourage you to read your Bible. Because your Bible will definitely clearly explain what God says is right and what God says is wrong. Now in the United States somewhere, there's an office that all they do is they hold on to the exact time of the world. They hold on to the exact measurements of the world. They hold on to the exact weights of the world. In other words, if I say this is three pounds and I go out to a place and that they have a four pound weight, but they say it's a three pound weight, somewhere we lost the true weight. But I can go back to this office, I can go into their safe or wherever it might be, and I can find this thing that says this is absolutely, truthfully, one pound. So no matter what's happening out here, I can always go back to the truth and say that is one pound. That is what the Bible is. Truth is kind of whatever you think it is anymore. But if I want to know absolute truth, I find out what God says about truth because he created truth. He created it all. And so if I want to know if something's right or wrong, I can't, I can't plead the fifth. I can't say I'm, I'm ignorant, Lord. He says, I've got this book full of all kinds of information to help you live right, to help you avoid living wrong. And so we don't have that. We can't fall back on that. It's, it's not going to carry uh, any weight with God. We've got to buck the trends and say that I want to do what God wants me to do. Again, I struggle sometimes, and maybe as a pastor, or maybe you guys struggle too, is to say, why is it that people fight so hard to not have something so wonderful in their life? Why? Now, if I had prime rib or corn on the cob up here with all kinds of butter, and I would say, would you guys like any? Most of you would say, yes, absolutely, it's good. It is good. Prime rib dumped in butter, better yet. But the point is, is we struggle very hard to get people to say, I want what's best for me in my life. God created me. He knows what I need. And I will fight that tooth and nail to accept that. Because the world goes with the trends. The world is a trend. When we fell away from the garden, we fell into sin. And that is the trend that we live in. That is what we are born in. That's what we're surrounded by. That's what we battle inside our heads. Is that whole concept of sin. 
And then Christ comes and says, with me you can buck the train. You don't have to live like that anymore. You don't have to fall into sin. You don't have to live that way. You can live a righteous life with me. I can clean you up and you can live a good life. Coming back to that idea of the premarital sex or those sort of things, Charles Stanley in 1998 wrote, God says sex is to be part of the marriage relationship. Satan says sex is the relationship. There's probably some truth to that. How many of you uh, fell in love with your wife or fell in lust first with your wife? In other words, what are we basing, what are we grounding it on? But they're saying that, you know, God says that sex is part of the marriage. There's no doubt about that, but the world says sex is the relationship. You don't have to be married. We don't have to do these things. We don't have to follow like the Bible says. It's, it's also, somebody wrote that they need to rewrite the Bible to get with our culture. It's so out of date with our culture. Well, maybe our culture is so out of date with truth and right and wrong. Because we don't like to hear those sort of things. Ephesians 6, 10 through 19. Let me read this to you. It's the whole armor of God. Not part of armor, not one piece of the armor. The whole armor. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor. Everyone say whole, whole. armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So there's a reason why we've got to put on the armor. To come up against the wiles of the devil, which is some of these things we've been talking about. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand, to make it, to make it, my friends. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. He says to be watchful with perseverance. In other words, you don't stop. He says to put on the whole armor of God. Why do we need to put on armor for Pete's sakes? Except that the wiles of the devil and the evilness of this world is out there to attack us. So how many of you, this is the question you can answer yourself, how many of you when you got up this morning put on underwear and pants and a shirt and then you slapped on the armor of God? Man, I can't wait to put on that armor of God. Where is that? Where is my armor? Oftentimes we don't even think about it. It's something we read. It sounds like, it sounds like we need to fight against this, the devil. But he says to put on the whole armor of God. If, if you're going to go to battle it, you know, for the United States military and they say, put on your helmet, put on your flak vest, they're saying you're going to get into some mess coming up. If you want to survive it, dress for the occasion. And so we come to find out that the world and all of its sin and all of its darkness, we need to be putting on the armor of God. And that armor of God is the word of God, understanding what this is so that we can fight off. But the problem is, is oftentimes that battle is inside us and not even outside. In fact, we're destroying ourselves just fine without someone else doing it. You ever come to that conclusion sometimes? I've shared this analogy, but I've got to share it again. It's one of the better ones, I think, about World War II when they're bringing a ship over from New York to over to Europe full of army tanks. I've shared this story. Worried about submariners. Constantly the attack from the outside, the attack from the outside, the attack from the outside. When are they going to bomb us? When are they going to torpedo us? Well, all of a sudden they got into a huge storm. And the tanks began to move and shake. And before long they broke the chains. Now these tanks are sliding from one side to the other, bashing on the inside walls of the ship. If they keep doing this for very long, they're going to sink from the inside out. So they finally got on these tanks and they got the chains back down and they made it. But they came to realize that they were so worried about what was taking place on the outside, what could happen on the outside, they didn't realize that the real battle was going to come from within. And that's where it is with us so many times. So many times we might even make the conscious effort not to put on the armor of God. I think I'll leave it off because I enjoy what takes place with it off. But just think about that. Who here really, 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 you don't have to raise your hands, this morning said, Lord, I'm putting on the armor of God because there's a world out there that I'm going out to face. Too many times we're reactive and not proactive. Reactive meaning, 
you know, the marriages are falling apart, the struggles with the kids, or, you know, all kinds of difficulties and depressions and all these different things. Suicide is up more than ever. Our, our uh, rate of, of living has declined for the first time ever since they recorded it because of suicide and drug overdoses. All these things are attacking us. Are we putting on the armor of God? Are we getting ready to fight the good fight? The movie War Room, where that little old lady talks to a wife about battling Satan in her marriage, said you've got to have a strategy. What's your strategy to fight these things? Do any of us have a strategy to fight what Satan throws at us? Or do you just react to it? You end up in the pastor's office because you reacting to what took place rather than being proactive to avoid it from taking place. The Bible says to take captive your thoughts. Why? So you don't have to deal with the consequences and the outcome of not following what God wants for us. Anyone ever sinned and had some bad consequences because of it? He's saying, you know what? Let's prevent those things. Preventative medicine. The big push for insurance companies is to get us to get healthy before we get sick. It's cheaper. They're motivated to help us be better health-wise because it's cheaper for them. Because if we don't do anything and we just continue to eat our butter and our mashed potatoes and gravy and whatnot, we end up needing more medical help, and it costs them money. They're motivated to help us, but are we? Usually I'm not. I always have the excuse, I guess, I say, you can live or you can live. And if I die five years earlier because I've been eating mashed potatoes and gravy, then I'm in heaven before you guys. So where do I lose in this? Because I'll be eating mashed potatoes and gravy and not tofu and vegetables and fruit. I'll be enjoying these meals and end up in heaven before you guys. That could be my rationale. I don't know if it carries much clout with God when he knows, when he speaks about hell. We'll just talk about Daniel. We've talked about Daniel many times here. But if you go into Daniel 1 and you begin to read, you remember the story about how they... Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel are all plucked from Israel, even though Israel was dark and not a very good place, brought over to another country, dropped into the king's court to say, you will learn from him for three years that you can serve this king. Well, along the way, they're going to learn how to, about false gods. They're going to learn new languages. They're, they've been plucked out of everything they know. It's kind of like being drafted, except they've been taken captive as slaves and brought over and dropped off. Everything they understood, everything they believed in was now gone. And they ended up there, and the first thing that was presented before them was the king's plate, the king's dining table, full of all kinds of good things. I bet it had prime rib, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, whatever. You, you guys all know your favorite foods probably sitting there. Like prime rib dipped in butter, that's pretty good stuff. And so here it is. You guys are going to eat like kings. That's one good thing about it. And they said, you know what? We're not going to go against our God. We're going to continue to do what we did there. What I point out is Daniel says, no, thank you. We're going to eat the healthy stuff. We're going to do what the Bible says. And you know what? God allowed that. God provided for them that they could do that. And they were in better shape than the guys that ate all the meatballs and mashed potatoes. It's shocking, isn't it? It's one of the first health studies that you can read about. So we come to find out that Daniel, while he was uh, had a lot of things surrounding him to keep him strong, all of a sudden found himself apart from all those Yet, he did not lose his focus on God. He did not fall into the system. He did not go with the trend. He fought the trend. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fought the trend. They're going to be thrown into a fire, fire, and they said, you know what? God will save us, but if not, it's fine with us. And God saved them. And because of that, the king then was saying, your God is the God. In other words, when we buck the system, sometimes we can speak into other people's lives. You're bucking the trend, buddy. Why are you doing that? Nobody else is going to church. No one else is trying to be the light for the world of Christ. No one's doing these things, yet you're doing those. Why is this? What is it about you? And before long, they might say, you know what? You seem a lot happier. You seem like a lot more content. I think I want what you've got. When we buck the trend, we also can teach people things. We can show examples. Parents, we can show examples to our children. Grandparents, we can show examples... To our children because they don't have any. We just read about how their morals aren't coming from anything human, not coming from anything spiritual. It's based on the environment, society on the outside coming in. So we all have a responsibility. We all have an opportunity to speak into those kids' lives. Talk to them about how to treat a woman. Talk to them about how to 
deal with the chance of breaking the law or stealing or all these different things. Tell them the experiences you've had. Teach them the way to go. The Bible says teach them and they will return to it at some point. But if we don't do that, the world will. You realize that our kids are going to be taught. They're going to be taught by somebody or something. We have that opportunity and that responsibility to teach them the right way to go because the world will tell them the wrong way to go. If you think the world is going to raise your children to be good, godly kids, you get that fallacy out of your mind and get busy to help them before the world destroys them. We talk about Daniel when he was thrown into the lion's den. It says this in Daniel 6.20. It says, And when he came to the den, meaning the king, because he had found favor with Daniel, he cried out with a a uh, lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And of course, we know that he did. But did you catch that word, continually? We can't buck the trend if we go with the trend for all week long, but then we come, we buck the trend and go to church for an hour. We, we just can't do that. Society is attacking us, and the churches are showing it. There was a study done. 17.7% uh, of reported Christians attend a Christian church on any given weekend, they say. They say that's a roughly 52 million when we oftentimes hear 132 million. So that's much less than we hear. 78 million say they attend church about 12 times a year. One time a year, once a month. 78% or 78 million say they do that. Do you think that 78 million can buck the trend of society by going to church one hour a month? There's no way. Defining a regular attending to church, this is how they define it these days. Someone who shows up at least three out of every eight Sundays. That's considered a regular attending to a church. Do you think you personally could show up three out of every eight Sundays and gain all the knowledge and wisdom of Christ to be able to live in this dark world? Do you really think so? If you think so, examine your life. Ask your loved one, do I show fruit of God? Do you see the fruit of God living in me? Am I showing fruit? Am I going out helping other people? Am I serving Christ? It's hard to serve a king when you see him three out of every eight Sundays. It's hard to call him king. So what comes first, my friends? Declining trend in Christianity or declining morals in the world? Which one's attacking? Which one's winning? That's the question we have to face. Philippians 1, 27 and 29. I'll finish with this. Everyone applaud. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, if we just grab onto that line, that our conduct each and every day, all day long, in the evenings, in the mornings, let our conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here it is in me. What he's saying is, you know what, society, it's one thing just to, to live life with Christ. It, it, it's a struggle. How many of you feel like it's a struggle some days to live the way you want to live for Christ? Absolutely. But now we have a world that's actually attacking how we live. So not only is it just difficult to be the Christian we want to be, now society is spending millions of billions of dollars attacking us, calling us intolerant and haters and all these different things, saying, you shouldn't be one of those. You shouldn't be one of those. You shouldn't be one of those. Be like us. You're only coming three out of every eight Sundays or once a month through the year for an hour. You know where you're going to make it. Prove me wrong, please. But I don't believe you can make it. There's no way. Diet one hour a month and see how you do on your diet. Change your oil once a year and see how your car does. We're always maintaining things that we value, aren't we? We're checking the tires, we're checking the batteries, we're changing the oil, we're ch changing trannies. We're doing all these things because we value that car. Then it comes to our own bodies and we're saying, you know what, Lord, oh, I'm just kind of busy. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe later, Lord. Meanwhile, Satan is on us 24-7, 365. When we leave these doors, we leave the light. Christ is here. Satan cannot be here at this moment. When we leave here, 
we're fair game. So I encourage you to buck the system. Buck the trend. And if your trend is to bend to do nothing, buck that trend. Start doing something. What do I do, Brian? Start just opening up the Bible saying, Holy Spirit, give me the words to read. Kind of guide me to where you want me to read today. Or I'll just pick a spot, but then educate me. It's not about reading as many verses as possible. It's about gaining everything I can out of every verse I read. It's quality, not quantity. So don't come to me and say, I read that Bible five times in the last week. That's fantastic if you're putting it into practice. You're bucking the trend. Because most people aren't putting the Bible into practice. You can't. If you're reading the Bible and loving God and spending time with God and you're only showing up once a month, you're not loving God. You're not, you're not in the Word. You're not in Christ. And He's probably not in you. If you have Christ in you, you'll start to see the fruits of that. And that fruit is to buck the trends of society. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And yes, I say day, Lord. It's not evening. Heavenly Father, this idea of bucking the trends, of breaking, breaking down society's grip on us. Lord, too many times we hear over and over again, if you watch the news, that we're being inundated with untruth or inundated with society's values or their morals, and we start to say, you know what, that must be what it is. Heavenly Father, you have a set of morals very clearly written in the Bible. A way to live as you want us to live. So for every one of us, Lord, we have to choose that we're either going to buck the system, buck the trend, and be all about you, or we're going to fall into society's trends, and Lord, we're not going to be about you at all. So Heavenly Father, I bless that you bless everyone here, that we have a hunger that we've never had before, that we're almost uncomfortable not being in the Word. We're almost uncomfortable about skipping church. We come to realize we need to hear and absorb it. So, Heavenly Father, bless everyone that's here today. Bless our time as we get together with the picnic, Lord. We just ask that you bless all this in your precious holy name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Again, just to remind you that... Um